In Charles Dickens' book, A Christmas Carol, it tells of the transformation of a heartless miser called Ebenezer Scrooge through the visit of three ghosts that come his way on Christmas Eve night. You have the ghost of Christmas past, the ghost of Christmas present, and the, co- the ghost of Christmas yet to come. And that final visitor, the ghost of Christmas yet to come, he takes Scrooge on something of a journey into the future. He brings him to a series of places. He takes him to the London Stock Exchange, where a group of businessmen discuss the death of this local rich man from the area, and they're just casually joking that they weren't left any of his money. Uh, Then he's taken to a pawn shop where there's some shady characters selling personal effects that they stole from the bed of the dead man. He's taken to the dinner table of a poor family who are relieved that this uh, unforgiving man to whom they owed a lot of money is now dead, and they don't have to pay back the debt. And then he's taken to the household of one of his poorly paid employees, where the family is coming to terms with the death of their child. And finally, Scrooge then asks, after all this, whose death? Who is this man? Whose death has been received with so little concern, so little love? And so he's taken to a graveyard, and he's pointed to a freshly dug grave. And and there, as he looks at the inscription upon the grave, he sees the words, Ebenezer Scrooge. And you imagine what a solemn moment that must have been to look upon his own gravestone and to be brought to see something of, if not his funeral, at least the events surrounding his death and the impact on the society around and what people have thought and so on and what's going on. What a solemn thing to be brought face to face with his own death. And it's pivotal to, at least in the book, pivotal to his change in attitude and character and so on. Well, you know, essentially that's what's happening in the book of Amos in this chapter. At the start of the chapter, Amos takes up, it's called a lamentation over the house of Israel. They're described as a virgin who is fallen down, never to rise again. The the dead body of the nation is described as being cast down, none able to restore her. Uh, And this lamentation is essentially a funeral song. It's a song mourning the death of the nation. Now, it hasn't happened yet. Israel are still, in fact, they're, they're, they're thriving, they're flourishing. This is one of their prosperous seasons in history. But although it hasn't happened yet, the Lord uses verbs here, uh, speaking of the, the, the casting down of this virgin. Uh, it's as if this has already happened. Uh, the explanation is given in verse 3, that the city that went out by a thousand shall leave an hundred. That which went forth by a hundred shall leave ten uh, to the house of Israel. Uh, the men who marched out of their cities to battle will be cut down dramatically, in other words, so that only one in ten return from the slaughter. It essentially means that the whole strength of Israel will be utterly broken. Uh, imagine, imagine for a moment the disaster it would be for Australia if the country was involved in some conflict and you sent your troops off to battle, the, the whole strength of the military uh, went out to fight, and only one in every ten came back. What a disaster that would be. How much grief there would be, how much trouble there would be for this country if its forces were so drastically destroyed. That's what Amos describes. And so there's reason for this lamentation, this death song, this grief over the death of the nation. This chapter begins then with a song for a doomed people, a people who are soon to be utterly ruined in the providence of God when the Assyrian Empire will rise up against them as God's judgment for their sin. And in many ways then, Amos in this this chapter is like the ghost of Christmas yet to come, giving Israel a little glimpse at their coming funeral. So you would understand that this is a solemn chapter. Eh, No surprises there if you've been looking at the book of Amos any length of time. They're all solemn chapters. This is a solemn chapter. And yet in the midst of what is a solemn chapter, a chapter that mourns over a dead nation, There are still glimmers of God's grace and mercy in this chapter. Because what you find is that the Lord is still calling out to this essentially dead people. And he's giving them a wonderful invitation. Israel are described as if they're already a body in a coffin. Or to take that picture that the body of the virgin just cast down on the ground left to die in the open country. But it turns out that all is not lost. At least not yet. Because the Lord is still saying to this nation, if you look at the words of verse 4, Seek ye me, and what a promise, and ye shall 
live. So I want to think with you about this content in terms of God's call to what we could say to Israel's corpse, the dead nation, cast down, doomed, ruined, and yet God is still calling. God is still inviting. God is still saying, seek ye me and ye shall live. God's call to Israel's corpse. First of all, let's think about the blessing of this invitation, the blessing in it. Seek ye me, God says in verse 4, and ye shall live. Now what a promise that is. God is giving them this lament, this preview of their funeral, showing the coming doom, which is virtually a foregone conclusion. But the Lord is also showing them life is still possible. You might be essentially dead already, Israel, but there's a way to be spared. There's a way to have life. Seek ye me, ye shall live. And with that in mind, it's worth remembering again. Amos, although you read through this book and there's so much of judgment and doom and, and worrying things that are said against the, the nation, Amos is not merely a prophet of doom. He is also holding out, oftentimes, gracious invitations from God. And, and here's another one. Here's the grace of God on display in the midst of warning and judgment. Now, of course, the whole chapter, even the, the book as a whole, does express in very solemn terms the judgment which is coming. And that judgment does come. But there's also grace extended to this people. In the midst of this, what an offer. Seek me, you can live, you will live. And how foolish the people would be to reject such an invitation. Now, just as you think of that basic concept, what we ought to appreciate is that this is exactly what the Lord does with each and every one of us as he brings the gospel of Jesus Christ to us. He addresses us as people very much like Israel, people already dead in trespasses and sin, people who ought to be crying out like the Apostle Paul in Romans 7, Oh, oh wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? If we appreciated the condition we're in, certainly the condition without Christ, we'd be saying we're in a body of death. It's as if we're dead already. We're doomed. We're lost. We're perishing. We've got no hope. And yet the gospel comes to us, yes, with warnings, but also with the wonderful offer, life, life, everlasting life, life in all its fullness. That's what it's all about. The Savior comes and he presents himself to you. He presents his work on the behalf of the guilty, his life, his death in the place of sinners, his resurrection from the tomb. And he says, seek ye me, ye shall live. Or as it's put in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. In the gospel, in the good news of his work, Christ comes to sinners like you and me, and he stands as if, as he did, outside the tomb of Lazarus. And when he said, Lazarus, come forth, so he says through the gospel to people like you and me, come forth, come forth out of the tomb of death. Come forth out of the death in sin and of life. Arise. And we could look at Israel here and say, well, here's a, here's a nation on the brink of ruin. How foolish to ignore this invitation to have life from God. Well, likewise, how foolish to ignore the gospel. How foolish to treat it as a small thing, as an irrelevant thing, or maybe as something that, yes, it's important, but not important enough to consider today. Maybe I'll just leave it to some other day. How foolish, when this is the very message through which God is pleased to give life. So there's a wonderful blessing in this invitation, a blessing that we all need. But then secondly, I want you to think about the direction, or you could say the instruction in this invitation. The Lord says to Israel, seek ye me and ye shall live. And then he immediately gives the warning in verse 5. But seek not Bethel, nor enter into Gilgal, nor pa and pass not to Beersheba. For Gilgal shall surely go into captivity and Bethel will come to naught. The way that God calls for Israel to receive life and to be spared from death and ruin is to seek him. And the idea there is to turn to the Lord with trust, with confidence, putting your hope upon him, returning to him as their Lord, following him. You might think of Psalm 77 verse 2, where Asaph said, In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. 
And he's saying, in my calamity, in my trouble, when I had no strength in myself, I sought the Lord. I put my confidence in God. I rested in his care. I drew near to him. I lent on him to be my deliverer and my rock and my fortress and my high tower. That's the point here. God says to Israel, put your trust in me. Return to me. Turn from other things. Turn from other hopes. On to me. Seek me. Now he warns them about putting their confidence in Bethel or Gilgal or Beersheba. If you were here last week, you'll remember we mentioned that Bethel and Gilgal, they were, they were locations that had been set up for the supposed worship of God. And they were religious sites that were always very busy. This was a very religious time in Israel's history. Uh, the last chapter talked about all these sacrifices that they were making, and they loved to do this. They were, they were full of religious activity. And these were significant places. Uh, Bethel, that's where Jacob dreamt about the ladder and he met with God and God promised to bless him. Uh, Gilgal, that's where Joshua set up the monument after God had remarkably stopped the River Jordan in its tracks and Israel went across on dry ground. They set up the, the, the monument there to the goodness of God. Uh, Beersheba, that was a significant place where Abraham and Isaac had earlier worshipped the Lord. Some of the, you could say, first forefathers of Israel. So these were all historic places, places that were packed full of re religious significance. But the Lord warns Israel, don't seek safety there, because you'll not find it. You'll not find safety there. Gilgal will go into captivity. Bethel will come to nothing. It's implied Beersheba won't have any safety either. The point again is, Israel can't afford to think that their outward religious practice will keep them safe from the wrath of God that is coming against their sin and from his judgment. It's not enough to just be religious. It's not enough to dot the I's and cross the T's, to tithe the mint and the cumin like the Pharisees did. Diligence in religion is not enough. Israel, you see, don't need to put their confidence in a place of worship. They need to put their confidence in the God who is worthy of worship. Now, we ought to take that warning on board too. We, we thought about it a little last week. But let's face it, it's a very, very common problem in every age. There are many, many people who put their trust in religious practice, who hope that they will have everlasting life because they are good Christians. Yet if your religion, as it was with Israel, if it's only ever religious practice and not a personal relationship with the Savior, then it's not enough. The church is no savior for you, despite what some groups might suggest. This church is no savior for you, nor is any other church a savior for you. You need God himself. You need Christ himself. Now, when it comes to the final judgment, you think of the, the warning that Christ gave in Matthew 7 and verse 21. And you know, these, are, these are frightening words. They ought to be very frightening words even to be read in a place of worship. The Lord says in Matthew 7, 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, he's not talking about the ungodly here, at least as the world sees it. He's not talking about people who have no time for the things of God. He's talking about religious people. People who call him Lord, Lord. They go on in this portion to profess the great things they've done in his name. Here are people who are actually at least in an outward sense, serving God. They say they've prophesied, they've cast out devils, done many wonderful works, all in his name. They've been very involved in religion. They've put their hopes there. They fully expected that there'd be a place in heaven for them. But there's no place for them. The Lord will say, I never knew you. D depart from me, ye that work iniquity. They might have been religious, but they never knew the Lord. They might have called him Lord, but they never knew him, never trusted him, never walked with him. So we all ought to ask ourselves, what about me? What about you? It's a mistake that many make. Many are making it today. The, the, the tragic reality is that when it comes to that final judgment, there will be many cast out from the presence of God who spent their lives in places of worship, who spent their lives even telling themselves they were good Christians but they never really sought the Lord himself. Is your confidence today in the church, your connection with the church, 
Or is your confidence today in the head and the saviour of the church? Christ himself. The Lord doesn't say seek the church and live. In fact, he warns against it. He says, don't seek Gilgal, don't seek Bethel, don't go to Beersheba. Seek me, seek ye me, and ye shall live. Now in the next place, think about the, let's think about the meaning of this invitation. As you think about seeking God, seeking Christ, we ought to remember that instruction in connection with something that Amos said earlier in this book. Back in chapter 3, he asked the question of Israel. He said, can two walk together except they be agreed? The point is there, if you're going to walk with God, then there needs to be agreement with God. Seeking the Lord then, it doesn't just mean some vague profession to trust him. It certainly doesn't just mean that you do a few more religious things. Seeking him and putting your confidence on him in him is going to mean having agreement with him. It's going to involve then turning aside from other things, especially other things that are grieving to him, in order that you might walk with him. It involves repentance. It involves turning from sin. You can't seek the Lord and seek to draw into his presence and take refuge in his care, while at the very same time holding tightly to the very things that would call for his wrath to come against you. Seeking him is going to involve repentance. Uh, let, me, let me jump ahead to verse 14 at this point. In chapter 5, having first told the people on a number of occasions to seek the Lord, seek me and you'll live. Notice what the Lord says in verse 14. Seek good and not evil that ye may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Is he seeking the Lord is equivalent to seeking good. And for Israel to seek God is going to involve seeking good. Seeking the Lord, drawing near to the Lord, it will automatically then involve a very visible and obvious transformation in the lives of Israelites. It'll mean hating evil. It'll mean loving good. And practically, as verse 15 says, it'll mean establishing judgment in the gate. Now that was, that was one of the big problems. Amos has put his finger on that issue quite a number of times already. There was no justice in the land. The courts were corrupt. The judges were corrupt. They were happy to take bribes. The rich were trampling upon the poor, not caring about the law of God, not caring about love for their fellow man. What's it going to mean to seek the Lord? Well, in part, it's going to mean reversing that wickedness, establishing judgment again, establishing righteousness and going on with God, obeying the Lord. It means turning from sin. Unless Israel are willing to put away their corruption, they can't fool themselves that they're seeking the Lord. Now that is important for you and me as well. As we talk the talk, the claim doesn't mean much if we don't have a heart to turn from the very things that grieve our God. Seeking him, trusting him, having our confidence in him automatically involves seeking good. Loving what he loves. Hating what he hates. Now a moment ago I mentioned that passage in Matthew 7. And you have that crowd of religious hypocrites who were religious. But they didn't actually know the Lord. And one of the, one of the telltale signs that they didn't truly know him as their saviour. That, they that they weren't truly seeking him. One of the telltale signs was that they were living lives contrary to the will of God. In, to draw you back to Matthew 7, the Lord said in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then Christ explained, But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. The point is that those are the ones who truly know him. Those are the ones who have truly sought the Lord. They're the ones who have a heart to love good. And to hate evil and to do the will of God. That's who knows Christ. That's who is saved by Christ. Now he's not saying these people have earned their place in heaven by doing the will of the Father. But certainly this, this desire to do the will of the Father. This love for what God loves. That indicates the heart of one who truly is seeking the Lord. If you don't have a heart for good. You can't say that you have a heart for God. Because remember God is good. 
If you despise good, you can't say that you love God because God is good. So are you seeking good? As I said, not to slavishly earn your way to heaven, but are you seeking good with a heart given to God, loving what the Lord loves? In the next place, let's think about the warning with this invitation. The, the warning in verse 6 of Amos chapter 5. In verse 6, the Lord says, Seek the Lord, and ye shall live, lest he break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Now again, there's reference to the fact that Bethel can't uh, help but you'll notice the danger that's threatened there. Seek the Lord and you'll live. What a promise. But what's implied is refuse to seek him and you can expect him to break out like fire in the house of Joseph and devour it. Now the house of Joseph, that's just another name for the northern kingdom of Israel, the people that Amos is preaching to. God is just saying to them, if you fail to seek me, I will be coming against you. I will break out like fire, destructive, destructive fire. I will devour you. And it's worth noticing then in this book that the danger being threatened by God here is not from a third party. Now, what I mean by that is God is not saying to Israel, those nasty Assyrians over there are going to get you, so you really ought to seek me because I'm the one who can help you with that problem. God is not saying you have a problem with the Assyrians, so seek me and I'll provide for you. The Lord is saying to Israel, you have a problem with me. You have a problem with me. Uh, yes, the Assyrian nation will come against you. That's the, whole, that's the literal fulfillment that Amos is preaching about. Yes, they will come against you. Yes, they will overcome you. But your main problem is not with them. The Lord is saying, your main problem is with me. They're just the sword in my hand. They're coming because you're guilty before me. So Israel is given a choice here. Seek the Lord. Put your confidence in him. Come again and walk with God, turning aside from all that grieves him. Come and trust him. Look on to his, him for salvation. Look, uh, rest in his promises of the coming Savior and, and take refuge in the Lord. But refuse to come. Refuse to heed the Lord. and You can expect him to come against you. Israel is told your problem is with him. The Lord will break out like fire against you. Now, you know, the gospel comes with the very same warning to us. Some people are prone to think of the gospel as the answer for the enemies of, I don't know, sadness, the, the answer for the enemy of trouble in our lives, the, the answer for the enemy, the devil. The gospel, the gospel is our way to defeat the devil or to defeat sadness or trouble or whatever you might name. Now, certainly Satan is an enemy, and yes, the gospel has an answer to his attacks. Yes, sadness and trouble can be, at least are ultimately, overcome through the gospel. But our most significant enemy, the gospel shows us this, our most significant enemy as we come into this world is God himself. Now, the problem's not with him. It's not like he's an oppressive tyrant making himself our enemy. The problem's with us. We have made ourselves his enemy. And his wrath must come against our sin. Your biggest problem then, my biggest problem, is not the devil or other people. Our biggest problem is with God because he is holy and we're not. The one you ought to fear the most is not the devil or other people, but it's God because he's holy and we're not. And yet the gospel shows us how when we've made ourselves the enemies of God by our sin, he is yet still loving, and he is yet remarkably still at work to reconcile enemies to himself, to forgive us our sins, to put away the enmity, the hostility, and to have us gathered onto himself as his children and his people. That The gospel presents us then with this wonderful invitation. Seek ye me, come and be reconciled to God through Christ and live. But there's the warning. That if we don't take heed to the gospel, if we ignore Jesus Christ, the only one who can reconcile us to God, that there's no neutrality here. It's not as if, it's not as if we, we've denied or we've rejected the opportunity to be God's friend, but just we're, we're indifferent to him and he's indifferent to us. There's no neutrality here. 
Reject the gospel and God remains your enemy. You think of what James said in James 4 verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity, that is hostility with God. He said, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. What a solemn thing to be the enemy of God. For the true believer, you're the enemy of Satan. And that in itself is a solemn thing. It's something we need to take seriously and we seek the Lord for help. And praise God, he is mightier than the devil and able to strengthen his people for that fight. How much more serious though to be the enemy of the almighty God? The Lord stands as a refuge offering life to those who seek him. In grace he invites us to come. But what a solemn thing if you refuse to set your affections on him and you set them elsewhere and you're still considered the enemy of God. In the next place, let's think about the recipients of this invitation. The recipients. Uh, who is it that Amos is addressing with this wonderful invitation from God? On the one hand, it's Israel as a whole, uh, and particularly then it's those who are perverting justice and oppressing the poor. Uh, but notice how the Lord addresses these people in verse 7. He says, Ye who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth, seek him that maketh the seven stars and Orion. So, so this invitation to seek the Lord, it is extended to those who turn judgment to wormwood and leave off righteousness in the earth. Now, now uh, wormwood was a bitter substance. So the point essentially is that judgment or justice in the land, which should have refreshed the people, has become a bitter experience. Uh, you would appreciate yourself if you have been oppressed by, by some stronger party than you. They've stolen from you, perhaps. They've trampled you down into the dust. You would want to get justice, and rightly so. So if the system, the justice system in the land is functioning properly, they might be a, a great tyrant with a lot of strength and you can't stand against them, but you take it through the justice system and justice is done and wrongs are put right and there's a, a refreshing experience there. That's what it should be. But because of the corruption, because of the bribery and so on going on in Israel, because of the, especially the rich and the powerful, banding together with the judges and the courts, which should have been for the refreshing of the people, were just an extra tool to oppress the miserable. It became a bitter experience, like wormwood. Righteousness was forsaken altogether in the earth. And it's the very people involved in all of this that God is addressing. Now, I want you to take note of that. It's important. Throughout the whole book of Amos, there is condemnation after condemnation. There is rebuke after rebuke, threat after threat, against these people and particularly against the high and the mighty in the land who are perverting justice and trampling upon the poor, practicing wickedness. Those are the main objects of Amos' rebuke. Condemnation after condemnation has come their way. If you asked Amos, who are the most guilty people before God in all of Israel? He would be pointing you to these high and mighty people in the land who were perverting justice, who were uh, advancing wickedness, practicing all sorts of corruption. He would point you to them. It's these very people that God is holding out the invitation to. It's these very people that God is addressing. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood, you who leave off righteousness in the earth, seek the Lord. You might expect the invitation of mercy to be extended to the poor and the oppressed in the land. And of course it was. You might expect the invitation to be given to some who weren't quite as involved in immorality. And it was. But the Lord specially singles out here. These people, even the most guilty of all the individuals, and the Lord sincerely calls for even them to turn from their ways and to seek him, and they shall live. I don't really have time to get sidetracked too much in it tonight, but I would suggest this is an important text showing us the free offer of the gospel. You know, some churches would deny that 
we should freely offer the gospel to all men and call upon all men, telling them that God is willing to receive them. Uh, I suppose it flows from uh, a twisted view of Calvinism where you, you, you have uh, the Lord has an elect people from all of eternity. He has graciously chosen a people to save. But then some would twist that and say, well, you, you can't preach the gospel to all people and tell all people that God is willing to receive them. Well, here's Amos, and he speaks to this sinful nation as a whole. He speaks to some of the most sinful men in the nation. In fact, he speaks to many of these people, many of whom will not listen to him, many of whom will actually go to judgment and ruin. And yet to these wicked men, he says sincerely from the Lord, seek the Lord, you shall live. The Lord is willing to save you. Now, of course, tonight, the great encouragement when you think of, of all this, and it ought to be a reassurance to all of our hearts, is that no matter how great we feel our guilt to be, no matter how far we, we think we've gone in sin and rebellion, e even if we think we've gone too far, uh, and Satan would whisper in your ear and tell you that there's no hope of forgiveness for you, here's an example of how the Lord continues to hold out that gracious gospel invitation and invite men and women to come. The Lord turns to the judges and it's as if he says, even you, even you judges who have perverted righteousness in the, the land and practiced wickedness and made life miserable and bitter for all around you, even you who are the greatest problem in all the land, even you can come and live. And of course, the Lord could single you out or me out tonight and we might have all sorts of reasons in our head as to why God can't forgive us. We might have all sorts of reasons as to why we, we can't possibly have a clean slate before God, why we've gone too far, why we can't have peace with him. And yet it's as if the Lord would single you out and say, even you, even you, there's mercy for you. You come, you seek me, you shall live. What an invitation. And it's extended to the greatest of sinners. Praise the Lord that the gospel is extended to the greatest of sinners. So we've thought about the recipients of this wonderful invitation. But then finally, finally, let's think about the author of this invitation. In verses 8 to 11, we have the author, the Lord himself, and he is presented, first of all, as what we'll call the, the authoritative judge. He's the authoritative judge as Amos addresses the high and the mighty in the land who have perverted judgment, he, he reminds them that the Lord is even mightier and even higher than them. He is the God who made the stars. He is the God who put them into their positions. He is the God who formed the constellations like Orion. It, it, it really emphasizes that God is not man's equal. He is infinitely superior. He's described here as the God who turneth the the shadow of death into the morning and make it the day dark with night. Now, on the one hand, that, I suppose, is a, perhaps to some extent a, a providential, a reference to God's providential rule over this world, turning night to day and then bringing the night again at the appropriate season. At the same time, the way Amos uses it here, talking of the, the shadow of death, there's this sense in which the Lord is able to bring life to the dead. He's able to shine light where the shadows of death are present. At the same time, he's the, the God who has authority and power to cast down those who seem to be thriving and flourishing. He's able to bring a night of destruction very easily. Uh, verse 8 continues by describing the Lord as the one who, who calleth for the waters of the sea and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. Again, the language there, it, it could speak of the, the regular cycle of rainfall. And I suppose in that you could think of how the Lord has the power to bless, uh, giving us, as the Apostle Paul put it, rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. There's power to bless there. We, we all know the blessing of, of a rainfall, as long as it doesn't get too heavy. At the same time, it does remind us, this language of God pouring out the water upon the earth, it does remind us of the flood of Noah's day, that terrifying evidence of the destructive power of God. Now, take it all together, and it surely emphasizes all the more how, how important it is to seek the Lord. Our God is presented here, even to these high and mighty judges, as the one even higher, even mightier, the God with power to bless and with power to curse. 
the God with authority to give life, the God with authority to take life. He is the judge high over all, not to be trifled with, not to be despised, not to be ignored, the judge over all. In fact, in this passage, he's described as the vindicator of the afflicted. He uses his authority to bring forth true justice. In verse 9, it tells us that the Lord strengtheneth the spoiled against the strong. He strengthens them against the ones who press them down. The Lord enables those weak and spoiled ones to storm the fortress. It's, it's language which speaks of God making things right, vindicating the oppressed. The, these judges in the land of Israel weren't making things right. Well, there's a greater judge, high over all, and he will make things right, and he does. Uh, then in verses 10 and 11, the Lord applies that to the nation of Israel in Amos day. The people have no time for the rebukes of God. They don't care for the righteous, and therefore they tread upon the poor. They take the wheat that the poor have worked to produce. They establish themselves in the earth all the more at the cost of others. They're strong. They are the spoilers. But the Lord essentially says here that they will be spoiled because of what they've been doing. He who is the authoritative judge will vindicate the afflicted. They... The powerful and the wicked have built fancy houses out of hewn stone, not just the common brick. They've used hewn stone fancy houses, but they'll not be able to dwell there. They've planted these pleasant vineyards, but they're not able to drink the wine from them. God will not allow them to prosper in their wickedness. He is the authoritative judge. And so, as you think again of this invitation, seek me and live, what a reminder of how important to heed this. Our God is the judge who deals with sin who puts wrongs right, who must be reckoned with. Not only that, but then in verses 12 and 13, the Lord is presented as the knowledgeable judge. Now, we all like to, I suppose, deceive ourselves that we can live as we please or in certain areas of life live as we please and will not face consequences. We, somehow, we tell ourselves that somehow God will never take a dealing with our sin that perhaps he'll not notice our sin. There'll never be a, a reckoning. Well, if that was Israel's thinking, the words of verse 12 would give them quite a, a reminder of how wrong they were. The Lord says through Amos, I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. God hasn't been blind to any of them. He knows them all. He's seen them. He's the knowledgeable judge. Now, again, just to, to think of this as Israel's funeral. Sometimes at a funeral, you'd have a, a eulogy spoken, a, a list, you know, a, a, this was a talk of the, the good points about a person's life. At least normally that's the case, the, the good points, the, the good things they've done perhaps. Well, here's the knowledgeable judge bringing his own word. And it's not a eulogy. It's not a good word. It's a word of condemnation. He lists all their sins. Not only does he say, I know them, but he goes on to prove it. He lists them. He says, they afflict the just. They take a bribe. They turn aside the poor from poor in the gate from their right. He lists their sins that have made circumstances whereby the wise and the godly have to keep silence. There's no point speaking because no one's listening. Now again, how important that we would take heed to God's gospel invitation and seek him while he may be found. Re refuse to seek him and really you're playing with fire. Because you're despising, first of all, the almighty judge of the earth who has power of, the power of life and death, the power and authority to bless or to curse. And not only that, but you're despising the one who knows your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins. Now, I suspect that for most of us, it's certainly for me it was the case, it would be a horrifying thought that when it comes to your funeral day, and people have gathered perhaps at the church to grieve and maybe, I suppose, to return thanks to God for your life. What a, what a horrifying thought it would be that someone would stand in the pulpit that day and would read a list of your most sinful deeds and thoughts. I imagine that thought would horrify you. I mean, even the idea of it happening at a funeral, it's just so unrealistic, it's, it's so unlikely, but... What a horrifying thought. And yet we all ought to recognize the day is coming when you stand before the judgment seat and the eyes of all creation are upon you and the list will be read and everything done in secret is exposed. And certainly 
if you arrive at that day and you've never taken refuge in Christ and you're, you're on your own, as it were, before God, there's no escape that day. You're exposed in your sin and you're standing before the God who has the authority to cast you down. Taking a moment to consider who God is, that the all-knowing God who sees our hearts, who sees us as we are, and the God with mighty power to judge sin, who will judge sin, who must bring forth justice, Surely a sight of him would cause us today to grab hold of his gracious invitation and say, yes, I will seek the Lord now while he graciously calls me to come and to have life through him. What serious consequences there are when the loving invitation of God goes unheeded. And you know, that's emphasized in verses 16 and 17. And really this is what brings us toward a close today. See, in verses 16 and 17, The invitations have been extended, but by and large, the people are not willing to take heed. And so this scene finishes by reminding us once more of that funeral and the dreadful woe that there is for the land as the judgment of God falls upon it. And verse 16 tells us that wailing shall be in the streets. It even says they shall say in the highways, alas, alas, they'll call for the husbandman, that is the farmer, to mourning, and such as are skillful of lamentation, to wailing. Whenever it says there, they'll call for the husbandman to mourning. Uh, we might not understand what's being said there. Uh, back in those days, it seems very strange to us, but back then, you had people who were actually employed, and their job was to turn up at, at the funeral and to make a loud noise, wailing over the death of the person. I suppose it was maybe a way to allow the family to grieve without embarrassing themselves. You had these professional mourners who were employed to come uh, to the funeral and to grieve over, over the death. Well, essentially, when God says the husbandman will be called to mourning, the point is such will be the death and destruction in the land that there won't be enough professional mourners. They'll even be calling for the farmers to come from the field and fill in this role because there aren't enough to grieve over the devastation in the land. It's another way of Amos again emphasizing, as he has done in this book, this destruction from God that comes after Israel have ignored the the, the pleading of the Lord. It's going to be a total destruction. And if that's worrying, the, the warning of verse 17 is even more solemn. Because all this wailing will come about when God says, For I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. Now, I don't know if that has the impact on us that it has on an Israelite, but for an Israelite, that is a chilling statement. I will pass through thee, saith the Lord. See, the Israelites knew their history. And they would remember that solemn day when their forefathers were slaves in Egypt and God passed through the land and it brought devastation. There was wailing in every Egyptian household over the death of the firstborn sons. God passed through the land and judgment fell. And on that occasion, the wonderful provision for Israel was that when God passed through the land, he passed over them. The blood of the sacrificed lamb was upon the doorposts and God passed over them. God showed them wonderful mercy. He passed over. They would remember it year after year at their Passover feast. The remembrance of God passing not through, but over Well, now, the invitation's ignored. God will pass through. In other words, he's bringing ruin. He's coming in judgment. It really emphasizes to us all that as the Lord graciously holds out the gospel invitation, as he lovingly shows us a savior in Jesus Christ who has died for the guilty like you, as he shows us that he's willing to receive even the most sinful of us and to cleanse us and forgive us and have us reconciled with himself, It is vital that you heed the instruction, that you seek the Lord and have life through him. It is vital that you seek Christ and, as it were, that you rest under his blood upon your doorposts. Because if you're not found saved through his sacrifice, through his death, through his blood shed for you, then God will not pass over you in mercy. He will pass through He'll pass through. Everything hinges then on what we do with this wonderful 
invitation. So let me give it to you again. Thus saith the Lord, Seek ye me, and ye shall live. May God apply his word to our hearts tonight. Amen.